On this episode of the John 1911 podcast, need a little help with the SP-1 project? The U.S. Air Force has a bird gun? Two-mile sniper shot in Iraq? And Angelina Jolie spotted at Army Navy store. Okay, good morning everybody. This is Marky and Freeze, and this is episode 67 of the John 1911 podcast. How was your night, Freeze? I was fine. <laughs> Just, just telling you before a minute ago, I was like, "You seem a little, you seem a little quiet." I'm like, "Uh oh, <laughs> this may not be a good time to do a podcast." Nah, it's fine. Just, okay, just long, a long night. night. Yeah. yeah, I'm a, I'm nursing a, nursing a uh, hangover. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't drink, but I'm, her- I'm <laughs> nursing a, uh, I guess a. I don't know if it's an allergy headache or, but I'm, you know, nothing. Coffee fixes everything, so. Just keep drinking coffee. It'll be fine. Yep. You know, yep. I won't, that's I won't, my motto. I won't, I won't stroke out yet. So <laughs> let me give you, I'm going to, I can, I feel comfortable saying this on the, on the podcast. Cause we're not going to go into too much detail. Um, you know, people know that we're looking to open up another range and you know, our regulars know this. Um, well, you know, I went out and I looked at, looked at the, uh, the thing yesterday and, you know, it's not the longest range possible. We can get about. I mean, if I if I pushed it, I could probably get 900 yards on it. But realistically, with no work at all and without being too much of a jerk, it's about 680 yards max. But and, and it's all doable and it's it's interesting property. But the I'm looking at the at the I'm looking at the surrounding area and I just there's a little voice in my head, dude. I just know we're going to get noise complaints on it, especially if we're shooting the big boomer stuff. So, yeah, that's what I was kind of telling you last night in text message. Well, <clears throat> yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're too close to a subdivision, I mean, you know, or 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 a, you know, a housing community, you know, and there's kids around, people are going to, you know. Regardless of whether things are fine or not, people are going to complain. Yeah, and you know it's it's one of those areas where, again, I don't want to say anywhere where it is, but it's it's an interesting area because it's it's farmland, it's ag culture, agriculture, I call it, yeah, ag agriculture, and which is fine, but you can tell it's slowly changing, and within twenty years, you know, um, this could be. This is going to be a full blown, you know, hoity toity whatever place. And, yeah. And you know, like shooting three hundred eight or shooting some of the standard, you know, I call them standard calibers, isn't going to. I don't know. It would probably be okay. But you know, like two seventy Weatherby and some of these boomer rounds. You know, you're within. I mean, there's some there's some residences the other way within probably about 300 yards, you know, from well, and it's just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, it's it's like um, it's like where I live, you know, I mean, I bought the property out here year. I mean, years, years before I built my house and. I mean, when I bought this property, I used to camp out here. I used to shoot out here. I mean, I used to do all kinds of stuff because there was there was no houses. I mean, there were houses, but I mean, it was it was pretty rural and it wasn't built up. And I mean, like all the houses across the street from me, none of those houses were there. Um, Now, I mean, I can still legally shoot out here. But I don't. I mean, I'll go out there and I'll, you know, do some, you know, I'll test some rounds or test some loads or I'll fire a few shots here or there. But, um, man, I just don't shoot out here, even though it's safe and it's legal. It's just, you know, there's just too many houses around. And like when I hunt out in my woods, I generally just restrict it to uh, bow. I don't really gun hunt out here. Yeah. Just, you know, and it, it's like I said, it's not that it's illegal. I mean, it's I'm, just why cause problems with with people? I mean, I don't really have neighbors right up on me 
But, you know, I you just get don't. No, you get a noise complaint, and then, you know, you have to, if you don't address it. And, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, the the original home that's, quote, on your compound, you know, I, I, again, I'm not give too much away, but that what that home was built, what, 1860? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, the, um, the original <clears throat> home where you they, live, it's they, still there, was built my, before the Civil War. Yeah, my, uh, the land that I had my house on is just a small section. I mean, this was a huge dairy farm in the 18, you know, in the mid 1800s, you know, and, um, the, the original farmhouse, which is just, you know, not too far from my house was built in 1860, but I've seen maps of the area that showed us a house in that same position. Um, and the map was from like the early 1850s. And that tells me that the original house probably burned down. Oh, you know, and they built, you know, because the, <clears throat> the original farmhouse actually has a basement, you know, it's a, you know, in it. And I would imagine that it's easier to build on an existing foundation than creating a new one. Oh, yeah. But, but that particular house was built in 1860. But like I said, I've seen a map with a house in that same location on it in the early 1850s. Okay. So, but yeah, this was a huge farm. I don't know how many hundreds of acres it was, but the whole neighborhood was one big, huge farm. And, you know, and then, you know, over the years it got broke up and, you know, and whatnot. And now basically there is no farm left anymore. You know, it's all built up. I mean, there's a lot of land, you know, a lot of woods and stuff, but, you know. But there's, you know, I mean, it's. If you look at this area, because I kind of drove around it and, you know, went on, uh, you know, looked around. I'm sure people don't want to listen to all this, but, you know, we're trying to set up a, we're setting up a, a gun range for, you know, for us. I mean, we, we have all these other ranges, but the problem is there's so much activity on them that, you know, to shut, uh, you know, if, if there's a, there's a, here's, here's an example. There's a video that I shot. I've never published it. And this kind of really set the tone the video I shot, uh, on a rifle range. Um, it's a three, 400 yard range, you know, not, nothing, not, not one of the big ranges, but it was myself and two other people on this range. And I'm shooting, I'm shooting some stuff and I'm running some video and I'm, I'm I'm on the other end of the I mean I'm on the other end of the shooting position away from these two other people, and the entire video you just hear you know Charlie Brown just just constant chatter, yeah, and it was just you know I mean you you know how fancy the cameras are and then also how fancy the microphones are and you know again I'm not Charlie Chaplin I can't be running video like you know, like silent movies. And it was just like, wow, this, I mean, even if, even if the range is technically closed, I mean, the less we're the only, I mean, there's can be nobody doing anything when we're shooting, if we're shooting stuff for video. Yeah. And it, and it's, it was like a real eye opening problem. And it's just turning into like the giant quarter million dollar project. I mean, it's just, you know, so Anyway, this this one property looked. It, I, I don't know. It, it it meets a lot of the criteria because you know a lot. You know, I wanted a thousand yard range. You know, you've been telling me that it's like, look, we don't need a thousand yards. I mean, your you your argument is for this project, most of the guns are going to be three hundred yards and in, maybe six hundred yards max, and that would be stretching it because it's going to be mostly Milserp stuff. I don't need a thousand yard. Camp Harry range. <clears throat> so. Look, we we do have access to a couple thousand yard ranges. They are a drive, but they're doable. And the truth is, for for video purposes, we're not doing thousand yard stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, we're doing you know close in pistol stuff, fairly close in rifle stuff. And and look, if we can get five or six hundred yards, that's fan freaking tastic. Yeah, so you know this this property I had ignored it initially because it only went uh, about six hundred, and was like, well, okay, I'll go out there and take a look at it. And um, I've been on it a couple times. There's been some 
other issues I don't want to go into uh, with a, with a, with you know with the with the seller's agent. The guy's a jackass. But mm-hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what. I mean, you know, if you're in sales out there and you've never <clears throat> taken a sales course or read a sales book. You need to look in the mirror and ask yourself what the fuck you're doing with your life. I mean, it's just amazing to me, you know. But I don't want to go on a tangent here, you know. If you, them, you know, people that like, if you were a brain surgeon, you would have training on how to be a brain surgeon. If you work in sales, you would think you know some basic sales concepts. Um, so anyway, I don't know. I, I, look, they would sell the property, and you know, it would work. You know, just. I just, if we're out there banging, you know, it's one thing to be out there for 40 minutes. I've been out there hearing gunfire. We're out there for like, you know, someone shooting for 40 minutes once in a while. That's no big deal. But, you know, you and me, and we're banging out there for three hours, you know, shooting Lord knows what. I mean, I could, you know, I could get to be a problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's another property that I'm going to go look at later in the week that, is a very expensive property, but it um it um it uh it's come way down in price, and I don't know if I can get even six hundred on it. I can probably get five. But the nice thing about this property is, dude, we could call in a beef two strike on this property, and it would be a problem. And it's about the same distance, so okay. you know, yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So. That's kind of just to bring you up to speed where we're at. I just I got I've got no I've got no valid reason as to why I don't want to pull a trigger on this property other than there's just a little voice in my head telling me, Don't do this. Well, I mean, look, this is a one shot deal. I mean, we cannot afford to buy multiple pieces of property. So if this doesn't pan out, you know, uh, you know, if we start having issues with people you know, complaining, you know, filing noise complaints because we're shooting, things of that nature. That's going to really suck. You know, and that kind of goes into another an, another variable. And, I, again, this is probably like an – even if, like, in my deep psyche, you know, I mean, this where this, this property we're discussing right now, um, it's where it's – I don't want to discuss where it is at all, but it's in a – it's in like three different municipality government structures that I have zero, I have zero contact with friends, coworkers, buddies. I know nobody out there. I, uh, strangely enough, I actually do know one guy out mm-hmm. there who's on the local PD. Okay, well that could come. Well, see, and you know, and uh, I would need to flag down one of the. Because that's the thing, you know, these people tell you whatever they want, but I would basically, I'd want to flag down a, an officer and, you know, hey, let's have a conversation. Here's who I am. Yeah. Let me, let's, let's talk yeah. for a minute, you know, off the record. What's going, you know, I do that anyway. Yeah, I mean, just to find out, you know, oh, you don't want to be out there, man. There's a meth, there's a meth lab next door. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I mean, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, it's amazing what the cops will tell you that the real estate agents won't or can't. So, so anyway, that's where we're at. Um, that's kind of been the big project. That's been slowing me down too, and even posting on John nineteen eleven because I've been trying to deal with stupid property. So, yeah. So, uh, oh, I, I, we, we we might just go ahead and finish all the conversations that we're having offline and just have them online. I have been this A one. I call it the A one upper. I guess it's not technically an A one. It's a uh, it's an SP one. This this original Colt AR project. We've got this upper I got in Washington. Um, yeah. I was looking at gun broker at lowers. You know we've gone back and forth on some of this, and you're going to have to probably do this because you're because every time I find a lower, I'm like a quote quote a slab side lower. This because we I have an upper that doesn't have a forward assist and it's an A one upper style upper, and uh, I find these different lowers, and you're like, well, that one technically could work, but technically not because the the collectors will kick your ass on it, or you know, it's a it's an SP one. You're telling me like another lower was I guess it it is it's a later lower not an earlier lower and it doesn't have an SP1 prefix but they're calling it an SP1 lower and you know and then I was looking at 
I was just going to be like, okay, I'm just going to buy a goddamn blower and just slap this thing together and move on. This is an AR. It's not that hard. And then I started realizing that the damn finishes don't even match. You know, and I'm going to, I'm like, ah, fuck. You know, it's just like, I, you know, I guess I have to look over at it. Hold on. I, I, I can't really see it that. Well, I don't know if the upper is black, if it's like that Colt black, or if it's like the Colt gray. I guess Colt has changed their color. Well, I mean, the the, the thing is, they have uh, it's a phosphate parkerized finish, and there's two types of phosphate. There's there's gray, and then there's a well, they call it a dark gray, but it looks black. You know, so you know, but look. I mean, if you just want to slap it together, you can just get any lower. But, you know... It, I mean, I don't want it to look like a hoopty gun. I mean, I like it to be correct. I mean, yeah. I'd just buy a, a Nodak spud lower. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, and, you know, maybe maybe it'll come to that, but not at this point, you know. So, well, I'll, I'll drop the... Um, I'll drop the... Uh, I guess I'll have to bring you the the upper and um, pick up the Ross and, um, you know, like, okay, like, for example, some of these upper or some of these lowers, I'm looking at them, I thought they were strip lowers, and then I realized that they've got the parts in them, they've got the trigger packs in them, or the, the trigger groups in them, but they don't, some of them don't have butt stocks and, um, and, uh, and buffer tubes. Yeah, there's... How much are A1 buffer tubes and butt stocks? Uh, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, look, I mean, what I would like to find um, is, is I mean, ideally, I'd like to find an early, you know, SP1 lower at a not a ridiculously stupid price. Um, uh, everything I'm seeing pretty much expect to pay $1,000. Well... Okay, if worse comes to worse, what I'll do is I'll buy an old lower from an an M16A1, you know, a parts kit that they chopped up, and we'll buy a uh, a slab side uh, uh, lower receiver and build the damn thing the way we want it with a, with all original parts except for the actual receiver itself. I don't really want to go that route, but that's yeah. that. I mean, there's there's enough SP1 lowers, at least for even like right now in Gunbroker, that dude, I just we're just gonna we're just gonna take it on the chin and buy one. You know, we're not gonna get anything for five hundred bucks. It's gonna be, you know, I mean, there, I mean, there, it'd be lucky to be eight hundred bucks, but it's gonna be nine hundred, a thousand, eleven hundred dollars, and just. Eh. I just don't. I just don't want to buy the wrong one, and then you're like, "Dude, this doesn't match. This sucks." So yeah, well, we'll see. Let me play with it. We'll see okay. what we can get. Well, I got to do that because if I don't, you may end up buying an A7 Corsair uh, cockpit, and I got to keep. I got to um, rein you in. Um, I tell you what, I saw that and immediately got a little bit of a chub. I have to admit, <laughs> I'm like. I'm like, you know, if I had the extra, what was it, 25 grand or something like that? It is. There is a, a what we're talking about. Because, you know, look, we're in the Millsurp game. I mean, you know, Freeze is our big Millsurp guy, but, you know, we have the Armory, so he's kind of the Millsurp guy here. And so we get all kinds of, like, emails and mailers and, all you know, like we get the, like that catalog I did the, I did the thing on for the, for the gangsters and the whatever. So anyway, get this email. From somebody who I guess it's a broker who is kind of representing some of this stuff. There is an A7 Corsair II with the airplane. You know the air if people don't know. Like you remember these old airplanes the military used to fly that had the big hole in the front of it. <laughs> yeah, it's the old Vietnam era Corsair II. They, I mean, they were quite common. So imagine the Corsair, that airplane, from the nose to probably. 20 feet behind the cockpit, the entire yeah. thing is chopped off, and you have an entire front end. Yeah, yeah. with the entire cockpit, ejectors, you know, the ejection seat, the instruments, it's all complete. 
27 buy it now for $27,000 or the broker was like make us an offer. It's like what are we going to do with that goddamn thing? Put it on the put it on the rifle range and shoot at it? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean it's cool, but I, I I would I would I would just sit in it and smoke cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and just just bask in the glory of being able to sit in a cockpit of a Corsair two, and no one else can. Fuck yeah, yeah. I uh, I mean <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> okay, um, you know what do you do with something like that? I you know I don't know. I mean. I, I would love to have it, but you know, twenty five, thirty grand goes a long way to building a shooting range. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, I mean, it, I mean, a, it builds us a, a a range house that we can get in from the lightning and the rain. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the 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 truth is, I'd I'd be in there smoking cigars and drinking bourbon, and then I would get tired of it, and then, <laughs> then I would just sit there and smile at it every time i saw it but they you know but i mean you know it's it, it's a cool item but you know i'd rather have a tank you could probably get a little tank for like 25 grand 27 oh, I, yeah, yeah. well for the price of that corsair i could definitely buy a tank i, I mean it, it's it's not going to be a king tiger no i mean <laughs> yeah. you could probably get like a t55 um yeah yeah i probably could so, you you had posted something about this on the Facebook page, and I, I haven't really followed it. I, I mean, I made a comment. I was basically like, nothing's going to come of this. What the hell's going on over at CNN? Well, CN, CNN is is coming to the realization that um, the the whole fake news Russia thing is a, is a dead horse. And the problem is they beat that horse so bad over the past five, six months, they don't really have any way to back out. I mean, the the shareholders at Time Warner, I guess, which is, I guess, Time Warner's their parent company or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, they they there was some kind of merger or then breakup at some point in the past with them. Yeah, well, the shareholders are like, look. You know, it's like you guys got to stop because we're th this is no good because it's costing shareholders money. I mean, you know, look, people are boycotting them. They're getting a bad rap. Boycotts work. Ask Bill O'Reilly. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously, you know, so the, the shareholders over at Time Warner are jumping on their ass. They just fired three three people over this whole fake news that one of the CEOs is like, if you post anything about Trump and Russia, it's got to come by me first. I'm mean, look, that's a Jeff I mean, Zucker. I know who he is. You know, I mean, you know, he's got to approve it before it hits the air. And, and then they just have this thing where, where they, they caught one of the, uh, one of the talking heads. Uh, they got him on, uh, some the, kind the, of the project Veritas thing. Yeah, you know, and basically them admitting, yeah, it's pretty much bullshit fake news, you know. Well, I mean, I heard that they had got it on tape that that producer was saying that Jeff Zucker told them, get off of what X, get back to Russia. So the guy that's come out and said, run all the Russia stories by me because this is crazy, is the same guy who up to this point has been like, Russia, Russia, Russia. Yeah, well, bottom line is everyone's scrambling to save their jobs. I heard the ratings are good, though. I mean, well, the only guy that's really getting hurt by this is Jim Acosta over at uh, the White House. He does the he's the White House beat reporter for CNN, and basically, um, whenever uh, Sean Spicer does a daily presser, they don't allow cameras, and they're basically now they're not they're so. What happens is if you don't allow cameras, you get the audio, but the, these guys don't get their FaceTime on national TV, which you can't use it makes it difficult to use it for um for the six o'clock news so yeah. they're, they're kind of it kind of is cutting into their egos and that's hurting him and apparently i guess sean spicer's now or they're not calling on jim acosta anymore because they're yeah. pissed off at cnn well so, um 
I mean, I don't think anything. I mean, what are they going to? I mean, what the hell are they going to do? I mean, is CNN going to go out of business? No. I mean, not going to hurt CNN. No, no, CNN's not going to go out of business. Um, you know, but you know, we'll see. We'll see how it shakes down. But but things are not looking uh, all rosy. Um. They're, you know, they're not looking all rosy over there at CNN right now, and everyone's scrambling around. There's, you know. Yeah, it's just, I, you know, I because I, you had posted something about it, and I figured maybe it was, um, you know, something that, you know, you, you might have known more about. I just, I mean, I don't know what's going to, I mean, hell, it's goddamn CNN. I mean, they're just, you know, I, I mean, they're just, they're pushing this whole Russia thing, and... Now I guess it's splashing back on Loretta Lynch and Hillary Clinton and um, Bernie Sanders, and I, I guess the word is now that they want to get off Russia, and I guess maybe they're not going to do it. I still think um, I think Trump's going to fire Mueller, special he prosecutor. Should. I mean, yeah, what, he should. I mean, what's going to end up happening is he's not going to just fire him, fire him arbitrarily. I think. I think uh, they're going to wait for another big round of leaks, and they're going to be like, yeah, this is over. You're leaking stuff. This is illegal. You're done. Bring in somebody else. Fire them all. And they won't yeah. shut down the investigation, but gonna, I, I, think, I, think, I, I think Trump is – I think if there's another round of leaks or these supposed bullshit leaks out of these, um, out of the, out of these, these groups, that Trump's going to use that as grounds to fire our people, because here's the thing: when Trump fired Comey, the FBI director, what a lot of people don't remember is Comey, the day before or two days before, had gotten in front of Congress and said some stuff that was incorrect, and he was caught in it. And they actually had to amend the record so it wouldn't technically be perjury. They were like, "Oh no, we uh, we misspoke. We need to amend the record." And it was at that point that the Trump administration was like. All right, we're this is it. We're done. He's this is this is ridiculous, and that kind of got buried when they fired him because you know that doesn't really fall into the story. But they fucked up. Comey's office, they screwed up, and uh, the guy he screwed up in front of Congress. And I, I don't think it was anything like you know constitutional crisis error, but he had said he'd given some information that was factually incorrect, and I don't think Comey. I don't th whatever this was. I don't even think like it was something Comey. Comey did on purpose. He wasn't trying to hurt anybody. I think he was just not prepared and he misspoke. And I think that it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And I think what's going to happen is they're going to do that with with Mueller. When there's something else goes wrong, they're going to be like, "Yeah, hey, you're out of here." So, you know, I just <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Hey, have you ever heard of Kaiser USA Firearms? Probably not. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's not ringing a bell off the top of my head. So, you know, I've been kind of... Um, I'm not a big AR person, as people can tell from our SP1 project. Um, but I, the idea of a super lightweight AR appeals to me. And um, I should actually look at our own blog page and see if Scott has written about these people. So it's Kaiser US, Kaiser US, so Kaiser like German Kaiser, um, they make they're an AR company. They make they call it the X7 Fusion Polymer Rifle System. You can buy complete rifles, or you can buy lowers or uppers, and they are making. Let me see here. They have an AR-15 that they're selling. What's the weight on this thing? God, come on, guys. They're not giving a weight. I think it's, I think, it, oh, here, 4.12 pounds. <laughs> and it's like, holy shit. So I mean, uh, yeah, that's 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 pretty. That's crazy. And of course, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, how do you? I think they're selling Faxon. I'm going to send this to you. I'm going to send you a link to the website. Um, 
I think they're using fax. What is? I guess it's fax on. You shouldn't say fax in. Whatever. It's grand. Yeah, whatever. Not grand. Um, but uh, I mean, if you were to buy one of those carbon fiber wrapped, you know, boutique barrels, I mean, you're in big money. But you could probably get this thing even lighter. I don't know if I'd want it any lighter, to be honest with you. I mean, it's still only a 223, so I was just like, I mean, they're they're kind of, they're pretty proud of them, but I think they sell lowers, and I know we had talked about maybe doing some lower project, or go, doing some builds, mm-hmm. and if they yeah. have a polymer lower that actually will hold up, because I know you can't, you know, I don't know this, I have heard this, but I personally don't know it because I don't build ARs. That I guess some polymer lowers are not good as base guns because you just can't take an aluminum lower, extru- you know, whatever billet, and then make a mold and turn it into plastic because there's there's areas that's probably pretty thin th- with aluminum that you'd get away with, whereas on plastic that would be an issue. So you got to change a few things. Um, so. It's just, you know, I just was like, man, I may, maybe we buy one of their lowers or something. So it's just interesting. I, I like the idea of a super lightweight, you know, I'd even buy like a cheap key mod four end because no one likes key mod anymore because everyone likes um, M lock because I guess it cranes shit all over the key mod. So it's like EOTech and no one likes EOTech, so you can buy EOTechs for nothing. <laughs> so, you know, because if you're a Navy SEAL, you know, you got to have, you can't have EOTech. Um, yeah, so yeah, you know, um, so I may be some opportunities there, you know, to build a cheaper, super lightweight gun. So I just didn't, I, honestly, how I saw them, I saw them in an ad in the NRE magazine. Hmm. Uh, I was, I can't remember the last time I read a magazine. I was traveling and I didn't really have access to the internet and I was reading, I was like, oh, I got a copy of the NRE magazine. I was just reading it and I saw the ad. I was like, huh, what the hell is that? So there's an example, at least for one one example of the NRA magazine, you know, working. So, I, you know, it's it's it's. I I hate to admit this, but man, I I haven't looked at one of my NRA magazines, and God, I can't tell you how long. I just I just don't sit down and look at magazines anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, most people don't. That's why all these gun mag. That's why all these magazines are going going out of business. Like even all these newspapers. Like I guess even the New York Times is in trouble because a lot of people just read their stuff online. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but look, um, did you hear about the kid? The college kid goes to James Madison University who was sentenced to 100 to 120 days in jail. Negative. I have never, I don't even know okay. who James Madison is. It's in Virginia. Um, okay, so. Jesus, I guess I should know that since that's where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, okay, so every time someone brings up, uh, you know, uh, requiring an, an ID to vote, all your your liberals scream, you know, um, you can't do that, it's not fair, it's going to prevent people from voting, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it, so immediately everyone on the right goes, well, it'll prevent voter fraud. And then the left is like, oh, there's no such thing as voter fraud. Nothing's ever been proven. You can't prove there's voter fraud, blah, blah, blah. Well, Andrew Spiley's, I guess, I'm sure I mispronounced the last name, who cares, is going to spend a minimum of 100 days to a maximum of 100 days in jail. Because while he was working for the Democratic Party of Virginia, he decided to register a bunch of dead people. And one of the dead people that he registered was a judge. And I don't know the full background of the story, but the judges, the dead judge's son, who was recently registered to vote, or the dead judge, the dead judge that was recently registered to vote, his son noticed his name on the uh, 
I guess on the books, you know, when you go when, in when to you vote, go to vote and then you sign the roll. Yeah. So his son noticed it and said, "Huh, hey, you know, it's kind of strange that dad's on the books and dad's been dead for a while. So he uh, he reported it. And uh, old Andrew's going to jail for voter fraud. Well, here's the thing. You can register anybody, I guess, all you want. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying legally, but if he doesn't show up and actually vote for these, vote in their position, was he voting for them as well? Did the dead judge vote? Well, see, I don't think that, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head if the dead judge voted. I bet you but, did. I'm sure he probably did as well, because, I mean, I don't know if people understand how this works. When you register dead people to vote and you don't require an ID, what you do is you give some guy, you know, five different names at five different polling stations and say, go in and say you're Bob Jones and vote. And then go to this polling station and say, you know, you're Dick Smith and vote. And, you know, that's how that works. And they're supposed um, to give you like a provisional ballot, I guess. Yeah, I don't, you know. But anyway, I don't want to get into the, the deep details to it. But anyway, this this kid decided to register a bunch of dead people, which in itself is illegal. Um, And, you know, and he was caught. Did you ever see the video? I can't remember who did this. I think they filmed it in New York, and it was, uh, I don't know. I don't remember who it was. I mean, I, I, I seem to remember it was a white reporter, and he was talking to all these black people in New York and about, do you have ID? You know, like, hey, do you have, do you have ID on you? And these people, you know, I mean, there were various, you know, I mean, it was he would he was he was basically he would he targeted black people to prove the point. And uh, some of them were older, some of them were younger men, women, you know, whatever. And they all were like, uh, yeah, I've got ID. You know, do you have driver's license or state ID? I've got, you know, they would say whatever. Um, they were like, well, do you know where to go get ID? And every and to a person, every single one of them was like, yeah, man, you go right over to the like the Twelfth Avenue, the BMV, right over. It's like five blocks away. Uh huh. And he goes, do do you think is was it a is it a is was it a big challenge for you to get ID or something? So basically, he basic he was approaching black people on the street that are probably Democrats. Probably you don't. I mean, they're statistically speaking, they lived in Greater New York, one of the boroughs, and asked basically was making the argument that the left makes regarding voter ID laws. Oh yeah. Basically, the, the argument is that I mean, I, I hate to say so, it like this. Basically, is, the, the argument, argument is, is that black people, are, minorities, and black people are stupid and they can't get ID. Exactly. It, it's it's the most racist argument in the world. If you're black, you you're too stupid or incompetent or poor to get an ID to vote. So we can't have voter IDs because, well, all these poor, stupid, ignorant black people won't be able to vote. That's their argument. Yeah, it is. The and it's the, it's the most racist fucking argument in the world. And I think he even was even asking him about. Could you afford to get ID? And like, I think some of these, I think were flat out like offended. They were like, it's twelve dollars or whatever. They said, well, yeah. And like, they all to a person, they all basically intimated. I don't know anyone who doesn't have ID. One of them even actually made the point, which is legally true, and a lot of people don't realize this. One of them said, "You're not allowed to walk around without ID." Yeah, a lot of people well, don't realize that you're not well, allowed to actually not have ID. I mean, it's a it's a gray area. It's kind of like one of those, like it's like stay away orders and uh, restraining orders. You know, in the strict interpretation of the Constitution, there is not a restraining order in the world that's legal, a constitutional. But they basically everybody agrees to not really challenge it because they figure it serves a greater good. And you know, requiring everybody to have yeah. laws that basically required you to have an ID, you know, may yeah. not pass constitutional scrutiny. But they're they're out there. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it it's it's crazy. Um, you yeah. know, I, I mean, look, dude, dude, there's so much widespread voter fraud. The, the the left the Democrats on this is just. Oh look! Don't get me wrong. Everybody there, gets free there's... government health care, but nobody has an ID to go get it. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, look. The truth is, there's voter fraud on the right as well. I mean, I'm not trying to say you know all the voter frauds on the left. Yeah, no, there's voter fraud on the right. But, I mean, there is. But but look, requiring an ID to vote. Um. will go a long way to preventing voter fraud because that's the easiest way of voting. Well, actually, it's not the easiest way. Uh, Detroit found the easiest way to uh, pr- uh, commit voter fraud. To commit it or prevent it? No, commit it. Um, <laughs> when when Jill Stein was uh, calling for the recount in Michigan, you'll notice oh, yeah. after they after they counted Detroit, the, the uh, judge shut the recount down and said, now nah, we're done here. Because multiple precincts, and the one that sticks to my mind, reported like 300 and some odd. It was it was a little over 300 votes for Hillary. Well, when they do the recount, they have to physically count the ballots where they don't count the ballots physically, you know, on Election Day. Well, when they went to actually audit the polling station, they could only produce 50 ballots. So I, 50 rem- people, I remember that. Yeah, and and there was multiple polling say because everyone, you know, I mean Hillary they wanted, to, they wanted to do a recount in Michigan, and very quickly it was like, nope, never mind, Trump won. Exactly, exactly, because the voter fraud was rampant, you know, and I guess the easiest way for voter fraud. Well, I guess is it was the pri- was it the, was it during the primaries? Was it Jill Stein? Was it no? It was no. It was the middle no, election because Jill it, Stein it, it, filed the Jill Stein filed the filed the complaint. Yeah, no, it was the general election. Yeah, you're yeah. right. You know, and it's like you know, I mean, uh, Hillary overwhelmingly won Detroit. No surprise there, but all of a sudden. When they go to recount, it's like, well, just in this one polling station alone, there was 250 votes for Hillary that no one could uh, uh, account for. And, you know, like I I tell people this all the time when whenever they're like, oh, you know, yeah, you know, uh, the Electoral College ripped us off, you know, uh, you know, Hillary really won. She won the popular vote. And I tell people this, look, it's real simple. On election night, going into California, before California came in, Trump was ahead in Electoral College vote, you know, votes, and he was ahead in the popular vote as well. California rolls in, and all of a sudden he loses the lead in the popular vote. But look, California brings 55 Electoral College votes to the table. And those 55 electoral college votes were not enough to uh, turn the tide for her. Okay, so the truth is Trump was winning in both categories before California. Their electoral college votes weren't enough to uh, change things for Hillary, even though the popular vote changed. But California, this is a classic example of why the electoral college works. The Electoral College prevented the state of California from dictating who the next president is, and that's why they set it up. This election is a perfect example from all these morons who have no clue how the Electoral College worked to go, oh, it's stupid. The people's vote should count. You know, this is a classic example of why the the EC works. And the well, actually, other point- back back in the day, the, what it was is you know the original thirteen colonies, and they all signed on to basically form the union. You know the the the, dem- the demographics of the country were dominated by Virginia, New York, and um, I don't know whatever, but like all these like Delaware and Connecticut and you know New Maine. Hampshire. Probably even Maine too. They would not have agreed. They're like, why would we join this union 
that's basically we're not going to have a say because basically New York and Virginia are going to run the whole thing. And that's exactly. why they created the system. Yeah. And, and the system works. But but here's my other point to this. Hillary won the popular vote by two and a half million votes. Now, in California, they don't require ID to vote. But here's the other thing. Even if they do, California gives IDs to illegals. <laughs> there they, was there was a report recently. They said somebody somebody had done a done a study and they said there could be up to five million illegal voters in this country. Well and how you, know, you you really think fifty percent of those are Republican? Uh no, I'd say ninety five to ninety eight percent of them are Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. But so. but my my thing is not that it matters at this point in time. But I truly, truly believe that Donald Trump won the popular vote. I don't think Hillary won the popular vote. If you if you weed out voter fraud, I mean, you know, maybe she did. I don't know. There's really no way to prove it. But, well, I mean, there is a way to prove it. But not, I mean, not not realistically. But, I mean, if you can weed out all the voter fraud, I think those numbers would tighten up drastically. I think that 2.5 million vote lead would dwindle. I think, I think they would tighten up, too. And, you know, like I said this before, and this is still true somewhat now, I mean, there's a lot of black people that like Donald Trump. Yeah, there are. And they don't want it. The, the, the media doesn't want to admit it, and a lot of them don't even want to admit it. To it, I, I, It's amazing to me how many black people I know. That will tell me they like Trump unsolicited, but they won't tell each other. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and here's the other side of this coin. There's a lot of black people that hate Hillary Clinton. Oh, well, there's a lot of Russians that hate Hillary Clinton, too. You um, know, and, so, you know, so, you know what? I want to say this just to say it. Uh, as far as the whole Russia thing is concerned, nobody thought Donald Trump was going to win the election, including the Russians. They were just trying to hurt Hillary. They didn't think goddamn Donald Trump was going to win. That's why that's why Trump I mean Trump at one point didn't think he was going to win. Vladimir Putin didn't think he was going to win. Barack Obama didn't think he was going to win. That's why everybody sat on their hands. Yeah. Everyone's like, "Ah oh, shit. This fucker won." Yep. Nobody I mean, you know, nobody nobody thought Trump was going to win. You think Vladimir Putin was sitting in no, goddamn you, you, Moscow saying, oh, yeah, Trump's going to carry Pennsylvania? Get well, the you fuck out of here. You didn't think he was going to win. And I kept telling you, eh, don't don't rule him out. No, that's, I've gone on public. That's, that's well documented. Yeah. I'm wrong. You know, yeah. I, mean, I, I said yesterday nothing's going to happen with CNN. But, you know, oh, three, three of their three of their uh, their staff members were fired. No, no, no. They quit with full salary. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever. Yeah. Fuck that. Speaking yeah. of, like, we don't think Republicans ever do anything. Dude, I saw this, and I think of this place. You may not be aware of what this is called. Have you ever heard of the retirement community called the Villages in Florida? Yes, actually, I have. And it's this, like, I think, like, 50,000 people live there. It's just, like, a town. I mean, it's a huge yeah, it's, place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. It's, the um, place is huge. You know, I guess every, every year I get one step closer to living in the Villages. So, um, <laughs> so I guess... What what county is this in? So I guess the the local drug unit gets um they get word that there's somebody living in the villages who is running dope. So they go in, they send in a couple guys. I assume you know I, you can't say that you can do sexist. Yeah. Be about dope officers. There could be female dope officers. Sure, sure they, there are. They send in people and they do a they do a couple buys. And they get so they're like, okay, this is definitely happening. SWAT team, they get the. Oh, look, I'm looking at the vehicle. It's a Bearcat. They they do the hit. They find literally they find dope. Um, they find dope literally sitting out on on a counter. It's like a full. It's a full blown dope house in the villages, and the the perpetrators are all 53, 45, 38, 43, and 63. So, but then, I guess in the upstairs part. They find they keep finding all these pieces to um to golf carts. <laughs> Dude, 
And then they actually, I'm reading this, and just as I'm thinking it in my brain, it gets quoted in the story, it's a golf cart chop shop. Dude, <laughs> I, I have a, a note here, because I jot notes down, um, and it just simply says, golf cart chop shop equals awesome. <laughs> that is Dude, so that, awesome. That, that is the most awesome thing I've ever heard of, a yeah. golf cart chop shop. That yeah. is so freaking Badass. So let me set the context here. So for people that don't understand, okay, the village is, is this huge retirement complex. I think there's 50,000 people that live there. It's so big. It's so big that frequently in the past probably three or four cycles, at least the past three, Republican presidential candidates, when they go to Florida, will actually have a rally at the villages. And if you, if you ever watch the news... You know, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, Sarah Palin showed up at the villages and they had a big rally and it was a friendly crowd, you know, like, a, you know, it's home safe territory for, 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 you know, for Sarah Palin or safe territory for Mitt Romney, whatever, 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 because this is what it is. It's a conservative retirement community. It's mostly, you know, it's considered a conservative bastion, but it's retirees. Well, it's a retirement. It's like, I don't know how many golf courses they have, but literally this 50,000 person village, you can live your entire life in a golf cart. You don't need a car. As a matter no. of fact, I think there's probably places where you can't take a car. So what no, they, these, they, they, they actually have golf cart dealerships. I mean, God, you know, so they, anyway, I guess there's a stolen golf cart ring down in the villages. And what they're doing is people, these guys were chopping up these golf carts and then selling the parts to people that need replacement parts for their golf carts. I mean, on some level, you got to admit, damn, I never thought of that. I mean, that that's brilliant. I mean, I you know, it. the criminal mind is just, I mean, if they would just work as goddamn hard, you know, in the real world, as opposed to, the, they, these people would make money. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, all they <laughs> had to do was buy used golf carts, break them up, buy used golf park carts in bulk, break them up, and then sell the parts. You know, they could start their own parts business legitimately and probably made the same amount of money or more. It was, hey, it was but it, it's impressive. Why, why buy why buy old used golf carts when you can just steal them? <laughs> yeah. Um well here's the thing, like so they uh and again nothing ever changes. Um so it's a dope house. And some of the locals are reporting on it, and you're like, you know, what's suspicious activity? Well, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, the house is unkept, and the lawn's unkept, and, you know, people aren't happy with the house, and, and there's always these people coming in and out all night. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> really? Well, well, welcome, they're like, well, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, 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 okay, so maybe this, so, wait a minute, so there's people coming in, coming in and out of a home in the villages at like 1 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the week? Uh-huh. All right, we'll send the dope officers over. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I thought that was I just thought that was awesome. So, um, uh, I saw uh, I saw uh, I didn't send this to you. Um, Angelina Jolie a few weeks ago was spotted coming out of an Army Navy store. Uh, in California. Okay. And you're like, why do I care about this? Let me see here. Um, what it was, she was, well, I just thought this was interesting. Um, she, there's a, you know, there's, I can't, there's a, here we go, here, this is the story. So Angelina Jolie, this was like just a week or so ago. Reporting for mom duty, Angelina Jolie dresses head to toe in black as she heads to the military supply store with son Knox. Apparently, Angelina, one of Angelina Jolie's sons is a little Millsurp kid. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Cool. Um, I'm gonna send. I just, I, I just thought that was, you know, I thought that, uh, I, you know, there's there there may be hope yet for. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, like, sure as, sure as hell, I mean, you can see her, they're, they're, they're in, uh, uh, it looks like the store is owned by a former Marine, uh, it's in LA, um, 
I guess the paparazzi followed her, and she's got her little. Oh, you know what? She's got security too. I see the dude. Yeah, I see you. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like the kid. The kid's a little Millsurp kid. Yeah, that's you know. Cool. I I wonder what he's got. You know, I'm mean, he's uh, how old was he? Let's see, how old is this kid? He is uh, eight. What did you have Millsurp wise when you were eight years old, Freeze? I know what I had. I had a helmet, belt, canteen pack, boots, uh, mess kits. Oh, I had I had full full gear when I was eight. I had um, the helmet, and I had the I had the the belt, the canteen. Um, like my I, stuff was I, from like from forty two. I remember it was four, 1942. I I had a uh, full 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 get up. Uh, I think. I want to think it was around, it was Christmas. It was, I was seven or eight, maybe. And um, all I got for Christmas was military surplus. That, that That's what I wanted. And, I, man, I mean, they, they loaded me up. <laughs> Seriously. So your parents I mean, bought you Milsurf stuff for Christmas? Yeah. Yeah, what do you wow. want for Christmas? G.I. Joe don't know. No. G.I. Joe know. doll. No, I, mean, I never you know. like to do that stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, that that's one of the best Christmases I've ever had. I was so freaking excited. I loved it. I had the whole, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, web gear. I mean, it was, I mean, yeah, I guess when you're buying surplus. Oh, dude, have, that stuff was everywhere back then. I mean, it well, was nothing. Now, my, my, mind you, this was, I mean, the Vietnam War was still going on. I mean, there was, there was a lot of surplus shit at the, uh, it, it, uh, as a matter of fact, I remember the name of the store, G.I. Joe's. <laughs> oh, sir, it's a stretch. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, no, um, it's not there anymore. Um, but, uh. But no, I mean, you know, yeah, man, I loved it, man. I got all kind. Of, I still have most of it. So wait a minute. So your parents took you. So you went and picked out what you wanted, or you? So no, you didn't. So no. would you come home? Or would you come down for Christmas morning? It was all wrapped. No, I came down for Christmas morning. It was all wrapped. It was just like, yeah, you know, it was cool. Um, no, we used to go in there because when I was a kid, we used to uh, we had a you know a pop up camper and we used to go camp and ride motorcycles and shit like that. You know, we did that all all growing up and um and we you know we used to go to the surplus store and buy crap for camping. You know, all the time. And uh, I I loved rooting around the surplus store. I still have my original P thirty eight can opener from when I was a kid. Um, and uh, and yeah, you know, I just wanted a bunch of army gear so I could play army and be the coolest kid on the block with my army gear. And uh, and so that's what they got me for Christmas one year. That's pretty cool. See, I we used to have these big wars with like the kids on the next street over. So we would, you know, we would like put on all of our, you know, our, our army stuff. Uh -huh. We would dig foxhole. Like literally, I it's a me. I can't believe like we used to dig like four foot deep foxholes in like our backyards. Oh yeah, we used to do that. And yeah. um, and then like we would get water balloons and we go on these raids and we we would do like these Indian raids like on the kids, you know, the next street over and like whack them with water balloons and run back to our foxholes, you know, Ooh. and hide. And, and uh, you know, it took the kids a while to figure out that what we were doing, <laughs> so oh, they never I they couldn't find us. I can do you one better than that. Yeah. We used to uh, dress up in our army gear and go out at night after dark and uh, shoot Roman candles at each other. Oh, dude, we did that. I mean, yeah. we were, we, we, we did, um, we did uh, Roman candles and we did bottle rockets. As a matter yeah. of fact, what I did, I've never told you this. So, I was so, dude, I was so proud of myself. I was a little kid. So I don't know how I got this, but I got a section of, um, of, a, of, a, um, uh, uh, gutter downspout, gutter pipe. And it was uh -huh. round. Like today, I guess a lot of them are square, but these were, this was round. Yeah. And, um, I was going to make a bazooka. And I remember trying to figure out how I could, like, I was trying to, I, I made it real complicated because I was trying to figure out how to, how can I put, how can I put, um, 
bottle rockets in this and then aim them at my buddies and I could still hold it and then shoot it. And I couldn't figure out how to do the ignition and I couldn't figure out how. So I ended up basically getting a, a mesh screen at the bottom and taping it off. So the fire would, so basically I would light them, drop them in the tube, and then I would run around and, and while it was burning and aim it at my buddies until it finally came out. And, um, yeah, I mean, I had a, I had made a bazooka with bottle. I mean, like today, dude, I mean, God, you'd probably be, I mean, the parents today, you'd be arrested. Yeah. Shooting bottle rockets at each other. Yeah. We got sucks. a couple good hits on some people, too. There were a couple. <laughs> it was just like, mm-hmm. ooh, 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 that would be a, that would be a police call today. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, uh, we, uh. And no, no one ever wore goggles or eye protection or anything. You know, it was, it was pretty much uh, fend for yourself. So, you're from Ohio, and yep. I saw this, and I literally was like, "We must have, you must have a buddy that's listening to your podcast, your rantings about Narcan." Have you heard about what they're doing in Middletown, Ohio? Yeah, you know, I actually was talking to someone about this the, uh, well, me, maybe let, a week or so. Let ago. me read the first paragraph. It's it's two sent. It's one. It's a. It's just a sentence. So people know what I'm talking about. Middletown, Ohio, seeks to avoid using Narcan to save people who overdose in an effort to fight rising costs. To deal with overdoses and its heroin problem, the city of Middletown wants to implement a controversial proposal that would let addicts die. City Council Member Dan Picard has proposed a three-strike system. Three strikes and you're out. I was like, they must be following our podcast. Okay. First off... I'm totally opposed to the three strike system. I I think you should have a zero strike system. I advocate the banning of Narcan unless it's used on, you know, like first responders. Um, But look, here's the thing. What they have to do is whoever gets the 911 call has to decide, hey, this is the third time we've uh, got a call from this guy and not notify, um, not notify, not not basically notify anyone to go out and take care of it. Because, look, if an EMT or a firefighter or a, or a law enforcement officer shows up on the spot, they're pretty much obligated to Narcan the sick son of a bitch that's, that's already OD'd. And even if they're not obligated to Narcan them, they don't know if it's his first time, third time, or 18th time. So the whole three strike and you're out thing just really, I mean, in theory, it sounds good, but it's really not practical. I mean, yeah, para- para- who, who makes the, you know, this is going to end up as a lawsuit. You, you know, as soon as. Here's the thing. Every time you have a kid that overdoses and he dies, there's going to be a lawsuit now because you didn't Narcan him, even if you yeah. did. Well, and, well, did you and, wait? Well, and the thing is, if you call 911, oh, my son is OD'd. And they go, well, you know what? This is a third time we've responded to this address for an OD. We're not going to send anyone. Boom, there's a lawsuit. Because they called 911 and they did not get the assistance that your tax dollars pay for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not that these people pay taxes anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, th- that's a lawsuit. I mean, the, ho- the whole thing's crazy. But you know what's not crazy? Stop giving Narcan out. You just take it away from the first responders unless it's in a... You know, a, uh, a basically a little bag that's used for helping, you know, themselves. Well, the but, thing is, you need the Narcan pretty quickly. You can't have it so it's not within within reach. It'll still be even if even if you could get society and everybody to agree that you're not going to, you know, save people. The people that you do need to save, you can't wait. To be, you know, you got a Narcan on pretty quick. 
Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, have yourself, have yourself, you know, 10 or 12 doses of Narcan, you know, um, you know, on the fire truck, you know, in their uh, medical bag, but you don't you that that's for use, you know, for first responder use only. Yeah, that that, that would never fly. This whole thing's never going to fly. But what's interesting about it is that people are finally starting to realize that this this is turning. You know, these dopers are just using the system to stay alive. Yeah. You know, yeah. you you were talking about on this podcast got dopers that overdose in in grocery store parking lots, so they will be found. Yes, we'll go we'll go shoot up in public. That way, if we fall out, someone will call and we'll we'll be revived. Yep, there's hillbillies everywhere, dude. Dirt billies, that's what you call them. I mean, you're you know, yeah. they're just. You know they're all over the world. Yeah, there are, and I mean, uh, like I said, I am not. I am. Uh, I am not a fan of Narcan. I hate Narcan. Yeah, I mean, I th- I remember the first time. I remember the first time I saw Narcan used, and it was in. Mm, I don't think it was ninety three. I think it was probably about ninety. Maybe ninety five or ninety six. Oh, the first time I saw it used, and it was I was shocked because this girl was out. This girl was this girl was dead, and and she literally was like, oh. I mean, it was like she come. I mean, she, it was like something out of a movie. I was like, what the fuck? And um, I mean, that was well, that was well, let's see ninety five. Yeah, you know, I mean, that was twenty. That was, that was 20 years ago. Um, 20 years of people learning what this is, and they're just, you know, they're just abusing the system. So I'm just. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, look. I, just, I Yeah. I mean, I, I, Narcan is a, it's a problem. I mean, you know, it's at what point do you balance the whole. I mean, this is the entire argument of like even Obamacare. You know, Obama got on TV and talked, you know, this woman was talking about her grandma. Grandma, you know, needs this, needs that, and grandma's whatever age. And Obama basically told her, well, just maybe sometimes grandma needs to just take a pill. Basically, you need to take a painkiller and die. Well, the thing, the, the thing that, that I guess that pisses me off is um, naloxone, was approved like around, I don't know, 70, 71, 72. People don't realize that this shit's that. been, this shit's been around. I mean, it was in, it was like patented in the sixties, but you know, it's got to go through the FDA and all that approval, but it was like the early seventies. This stuff's been around forever. Um, but the problem is it wasn't really. It really wasn't used. I mean, like paramedics didn't carry it on them, and I mean, oh, it'd be hosp- at the hospital, yeah, if you hospitals, made it to the hospital, yeah, hospitals had it, and and things of that nature. But you know, you know, this, this thing's gotten so out of control, and you know, the th- the thing is, people talk about the, you know, the, all the heroin ec- epidemic is so bad. No, truthfully, the heroin epidemic today is the same as it was twenty years ago. The problem is, twenty years ago, when you OD'd, you died. I don't. Th- I I think that's a bit of a. I don't think heroin. No, because. I remember the first time I saw heroin on the street, and it was, I mean, people had heard of heroin, but most people had never seen it. Ah, bullshit. I mean, when I when I was a freaking teenager, I, I saw heroin. Well, heroin was kind of coming down off the, uh, heroin was, was, heroin was, was a drug that was around in the 70s. In the 60s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, definitely in the 60s, but that's what I'm saying. It was still around in the 70s. But it was kind of went away. No, it never really went away, dude. It was around in the eighties and the nineties. As always, some like I would see it with the uh, the biker gangs would occasionally get some. Yeah, Um, they would get a little bit to mess with it, but you know they didn't know how to handle it, so it was always a big drama with them. Um, 
what the hell else was it? Uh, so are you afraid to fly? No. If you were afraid to fly, do you think it would be a good idea to throw coins into the engine of an airplane as good luck? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, every good Buddhist does that. <laughs> this, I, uh, uh, this, I guess, finally made uh, international news, but this was reported like two days ago. This old woman in Shanghai, she, I guess, this 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 airplane terminal in in China, you can walk across the tarmac to go up the stairs to get on the airplane. <laughs> so she's walking a walk in front of this airplane to get on it and she's got coins and she throws coins for good luck into the ponds you know into the (laughs) pools of water and she literally took some coins and threw them into the engine as it was running and it's like oh fuck yeah i bet you on i mean they i guess they they uh they um they ended up shutting it. You know, the, the flight got canceled in five hours or whatever. But I, 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 coins are pretty small. Airplanes are, airplane engines are designed to be able to absorb, you know, pretty big, pretty big, you know, things. So, yeah, well, a bird, birds have been known to bring planes down, and they're a lot softer than coins. Dude, I know a guy, I know a guy, um, who, uh, who who works in that industry or he did and they had this whatever engine it was and they're you know they're doing all these things and they're i guess they're the point where they're testing it for bird strikes and so what they did is they took it out to their jet engine testing facility and they're you know setting it up turning it on it's like on a stand in a field and they're throwing throwing bird carcasses into the engine. Every time they throw a bird carcass into this engine, the engine, like, blows apart. And they're just like, you know, they, they literally can't figure this out. They're like, we built this to the same tolerances as every other engine we've done as far as this is concerned. It's, it's you know, this, 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 and this. We can't figure out why this engine, it's like, it's, they should be able to at least keep running and they, certain performance parameters. I don't, I'm not an engine guy. Were, you know, were, were they shooting frozen birds into it? Yes. Yeah, they were I, frozen. Uh, I actually knew a guy years ago who uh, worked on the uh, bird gun at Wright Pat. The bird gun at Wright Pat? No, I don't know this one. This was um, this was in another facility. Um, actually, I think it was it was on Wright Pat's facility. But uh, you know, G. Yeah. They you know they. This guy's GE G- too. Yeah, he told. He's the yeah. guy from GE. Told me this. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he was a, he worked for GE and their GE had a bird gun to test their engines and uh, it's it's a big air compressed cannon that shoots a bird carcass into the engine and I believe it was on Wright Pat's facility on their property. I could could be wrong on where it was located, but regardless, it's not important. But um, but yeah, um, he used to. Uh, I don't know if he was the guy that actually, you know, pulled the lever on the cannon, but he, he but he he worked up there in the testing facility and uh, worked on the bird gun. That's you know I, I you know I guess bird guns not going to make it to the title of the uh, title of the uh, of the podcast. You know you know what people don't think they don't you know they don't even really think about it. So you know just people okay yeah shoot the bird in the uh, do what I told. You know people don't think about what they're actually doing or what the goals really are. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's you know, um, but look, you know, I mean, is I, you know, I don't know if they still use the bird gun. I re- I think I recall a few years ago a bunch of uh, animal rights people raising hell about the bird gun, and they either had to shut it down or just do it more in private. But look, anyone who flies. Ought to be thankful that they're shooting birds into these engines to test them, you know? Oh, they have to. Oh, yeah. Oh, I remember I was flying out of, um, where the hell was it? A pretty major airport, and we were coming up, and, uh, you know, you, you launching for your takeoff. <laughs> it's a civilian airplane, a uh, commercial airplane, and a lot, of, uh, this is my opinion. And you know, a lot, I, people may disagree with this, but I, I I've flown a lot and jumped out of airplanes, and I, I yeah I know I know a little bit about airplanes. To me, the most dangerous time in an airplane flight is the takeoff. 
Because if something goes wrong and you don't have enough energy to stay airborne, you're going in. You know, you're 30,000 feet up in the air. You can glide a long way. you got a long time to figure out how to get down. But if you're in your, you know, initial launch and, you know, the engines die or they go half power or, you know, whatever, you're going to eat it because you just don't have the altitude to save you. you got, you know, you don't have any time. Now, remember, we're, you know, we're, this, this plane was, man, this plane was heavy too. And, um. Because, you know, I, you, you get on – if you fly a lot, you're on planes and you're like, you know, zip and you get up quick. And there's some planes you're on, you're like, Jesus, are you going to go to the end of the runway before you lift this plane off? So – which always makes me a little nervous. And we're coming up, and literally I see it coming. It's a line of birds. And it was little birds. Like it wasn't like flying turkeys or anything, but it was, you know, I was like – I had enough time to go – and I literally, you could hear on the airplane, it went like, like you heard, like that. And that was it. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody on the plane, any of the passengers, even realized that there was even their chance. But I was like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm listening to the engines like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. And uh, like, well, you know, he's powering on through and the engines are turning. You don't, you don't feel any disruptions. Like, I guess we're going to be fine. Maybe nothing went to the engine. So, and it, you know, <clears throat> well, I was, I was uh, doing some diving down in Florida this is years ago and we decided to uh, shoot over to the Bahamas and we got on this little, little commuter, commuter plane. It was a, you know, twin turbo prop and we're sitting in our seats waiting, you know, waiting to get on. And I look out the window and there's two mechanics and they got the cow off the engine and this guy's got a wrench you know a ratchet and he pulls this long this bolt had to be a foot long and he pulls it out of the engine and he's and he's holding it up and he's talking to the guy and i looked over at my buddy and i'm like dude this guy just pulled a freaking bolt out of the goddamn engine i'm not feeling too good about this flight <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we we sat there watch him i mean they put it back in and they you know, did what they had to do. And, oh, and, yeah. And, you know, we, we made it, but it was like, holy crap. Oh, those, dude. those, it, those little bullshit airplanes, dude. Oh, my God. They go down all the time. <laughs> it's oh. like, Jesus Christ, man. Do we really need to die the Bahamas right now? Who, who, you know? who was the guy? Was it Ernest Hemingway? The guy had two. A guy had been in two plane crashes in one day. He was in some little little podunk airplane. It was in Africa. The plane ends up crash landing. They call for help. A, help arrives. They get him into another little plane, and that plane crashes. Uh, I I haven't heard was that. that. I was. I mean, it was obviously I wasn't there, but it's. A, I think that was Ernest Hemingway or one of these. You know, people. I mean, it's, yeah, these little planes, dude. They. Like, I know people that have had to fly in some of these bullshit helicopters overseas. I mean, they're just literally like, you know, these Russian helicopters, and it's just like, these things are goddamn nightmares. I mean, mm-hmm. they, these things crash all the time. You know, I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, well, I mean, here's a perfect example. Um, you, like, most people don't realize this, you know, when, um, when um, the president of China or... You know, I guess it would be Putin, the president of Russia or, say, the prime minister of of England. I'm trying to think of like the the leaders of some of these major, you know, pseudo I would England a major. I wouldn't consider England a major world power anymore. Sorry, England, but it's true. Um, A lot of the a lot of these people, if they come to, you know, let's say they're going to come and visit President Trump and they're moving or they're on a state visit. They actually. I mean, they, they fly in their own airplane and whatever, but they don't typically fly in, um, say, like British helicopters or Russian helicopters or Chinese helicopters. The only state leader in the world that travels with his, until there's a her, his own helicopter uh, contingent is the uh, is the president of the United States because we that nobody trusts helicopters anywhere. I mean there are a lot of reasons. 
you know, a, you know, control, command and control and whatever. But, you know, these just these little itty bitty, it's it, these little itty bitty aircraft are all around the world. Nobody believes in them at all. Mm. Your, your, your chances of having accidents in these little airplanes go sky high. You know, and yeah. just, you know, I mean, uh, man, getting on a little airplane flying from one little island to another in the Bahamas, oof, that would be, I got to admit, dude, that'd be like, oh, God. No, today we fly you to Yaman. We fly you to Jamaica. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, it's like, where's the, where, you know, where's, where's the freaking, where's the life jacket? You know? Uh, um, so. Well, yeah. All so, right. what? Uh, did did you hear about Sarah Palin suing the uh, the I guess it's the New York Times? You know, I did. I heard a little bit about it, and she actually may have a case. I mean, the libel laws for public figures. I mean, she's. I mean, she she ran for vice president of the United States. You know, I guess her argument could be that first of all, this wasn't true. Second of all, I'm not in public eye anymore and haven't been for a number of years. But then, you know, is that really true? She still does public stuff. I think I, I think it's just a way to maybe get some soak the New York Times out of some money to hurt them because I know they're hurting for money. Yeah. I mean, I, what are they going to do? Change change the law in this country? Is this going to set a new a new standard for libel? Oh, because of the Sarah Palin case, you know, Sarah v. You know, Palin v. New York Times uh, cite the the Palin v. New York Times twenty eighteen case. You know, you can't do this anymore. Yeah, whatever. That's not going to happen. You know, I, I'm glad to see her do it. It's because I think that New York Times are a bunch of bunch of you know bunch of ass wipes anyway. So yeah. Hey, um, we didn't talk about this last time. Um, the Canadian sniper, they got the two point something mile shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you, has there been any more updates on that? I guess the guy was using a mill and tack 50. Yeah. He was using a tack 50. Um, I look, I mean, that's awesome that he, you know, he, he did a, uh, what was it like a, a two mile kill? I think they're, what's the official distance? Two point, I don't know. Two, it's, it's over two. Okay. And that, that that's awesome. But 2.14 miles, 3,450 meters. I mean, I mean, the, the truth is, man, I just, I just don't care. I mean, look, these, these snipers are, I mean, they're they're all breaking these records for long distance kills, um, and I mean, it's almost like they're competing to get the headlines. You know what? I, that, I don't. That's I don't. I had a, we had a a regular on our Facebook page sent us a private message, and and she reached out and she sent this to us, and she wanted to know what I thought of it. And this is literally the next day. Like I didn't even know. Like, I guess we know a little bit more now. I haven't paid that much attention to it. But I told her, I said, look, I said, first of all, I don't know any of the real details. I know as much as anybody else, but very little at the first point. So I, I may be operating from in, incorrect information. Yeah. The second point I said, I said, look, I said, it seems to me that a lot of this, people are setting up these shots just to kind of showboat a little bit here and here and here's the argument that i made to her and our listeners just to make a point if 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 your job is to be a sniper and you know whatever loose interpretation you have of what that means to you if this shot was taken at 3450 meters okay so if you if if you if you I can't help but feel that if your job, if you're conducting your job, your mission, your MOS at 3,000 meters, I can't help but feel that you can do your job two or three times better at 1,000 meters. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I just, I'm kind of over. I mean, look, I'm not saying it's not amazing. It is. It's freaking amazing. You know, it isn't, you know, that's great. But it's just, man, over the past several years, you know, 
you know, a uh, half a mile, mile, mile and a half, you know, it's just like, eh, it's not really exciting news to me anymore. You know, it's, you know, it's good to know attack 50 old, old, you know, do a kill shot at 2.2 miles or whatever the hell it was. But, um, I don't know, man. It just, I just can't get excited about it. You know, it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel the same way, and I don't. I, I, I guess we're probably in the minority, but we actually shoot, and you know, we shoot longer ranges, and it's like, I don't know. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, you know, look, I mean, let's let's be honest. You know, give me attack fifty, throw it, throw a, a a freaking eight by eight piece of steel up at two miles away. And first off, I'd be lucky to even see the damn thing, much less hit it. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's it's an incredible shot. I'm not saying it's not. You know, I mean, the guy is knows his shit. He, you know, he fired it like artillery. There, I mean, this is. I mean, this thing must have gone up like. I mean, I mean, I mean, what's the, I mean, what's the maximum ordinal point of attack fifty of a fifty BMG bullet at at at. 34, I mean, I mean, shit, I don't know. What is that? Like, I have like a thousand, no idea. I mean, it was like a thousand feet or something. I mean, it could, I don't know what it is. It could be 2,000. I mean, I have no idea. But yeah, this, this I mean, thing literally has got to be fired like freaking artillery. Oh, yeah. I mean, geez, he lobbed it in, you know. And, I mean, you know, it was a great shot. But, again, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know what? It's... Uh, you know, kudos to him for breaking the record, but I just, I just can't get excited over it. I mean, it's it doesn't do anything for me. It's like kind of like been there, done that. You know, not not that I've been there and done that, but I mean, it's just like yeah, okay. So, you know, I stopped getting excited. You know, when when they started killing people at a mile and a half. You know, it's just like okay. Yeah, you're you're getting. To, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not that up on the fifty. Like, there's a couple of things here. You know, this I, is, actually, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't a three thirty eight Lapua over the. I mean, I'm, I it kind of shocked me that it was attack fifty when I first heard about it. But not that you know, not that a you know a, a fifty BMG can't reach out that far. But I just, like I said, I was just kind of. You know, I just when I first heard the blurb, I just assumed he was using three thirty eight. You know, my bad. I, you know, I um, yeah, I don't know what kind of ammo they're using or what kind of ballistic coefficient, but it's like, I, I mean, it for for like okay, I used to see there was a you know there's a couple of these places on the internet where all the cool kids go to be cool kids about long range shooting. And it, I, I've made this point before. And there was a time when you would see people were like, oh, I'm going to get me a 338 Lapua. And I'm just going to shoot that because I want to be able to shoot long range. And, you know, they, the guys don't even really can't even shoot a hundred yards, but they're like, I want one gun to do it all. And they start to figure out that 338 Lapua kind of sucks. Every, I mean, shooting that gun I mean, it can. There's a little bit of a suck factor there, whether it's price or recoil or blast. And 50s kind of the same way. And you know, this TAC 50 isn't even like a, a semi-automatic Barrett. It's a bolt gun, dude. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I would ever want to pull the trigger on a 50 BMG bolt gun. Maybe it's because I'm getting <laughs> older. But you know, there's guns. I you know maybe when I was younger, I'd be like, oh yeah, I want to shoot that so I can have the experience. I'm to the point now in my life. I'm like, nah, man, you go ahead. Yeah, I, I you know, <laughs> like, oh, dude, I I was talking to a guy the other day. He was shooting his um his uh, weather 340 Weatherby. Well, you know, and again, that's not a 50 BMG or a three even 338. And I've got a 338, but it's like he this guy he he shoots these big. I call them horse rounds. Oh, surprise. He had a detached <laughs> retina. Yeah. He'd been shooting these guns for 30, 40 years, 
And, you know, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I was going into my eye doctor, and the doctor said I tried a partially detached retina. It probably just from age. I don't even know when I did it. I'm like, I know how you fucking did it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, I mean, you have to start kind of like pacing yourself a little bit as you're getting older. It's like, you know, what's the payoff here on some of this stuff? It's like, uh, you yeah. know, I mean, well, hey, dude, look. I don't even want to shoot. I don't even have you ever actually seen the video of guys shooting again? Someone I'm going to get called out on this one, but I'm just going to be just going to be real here. Uh, the uh, the Steyr Scout Rifle, the Steyr, you know, the Jeff Cooper Steyr Scout Rifle. And you see people shooting it in 308. That is a little short barreled, lightweight gun. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll see people shoot that thing. It's in 308. Again, it's not a horse round. It's fucking 308. But it holds five rounds in a magazine. And you have like an extra magazine you can put in the buttstock, five more rounds. And, you know, you'll see people shooting that gun. And it's not it's not the funnest gun to shoot. You know, oh, no. and, it's, and it's to me, shooting is about about you know, training and experience and knowledge and skill and some of it's wild ass, you know, educated wild ass guessing, you know, ah, from my experience, I'm going to, I'm just going to hold off a little bit this way. You really can't build up those kinds of, those kinds of inherent intuitive, I would call a magic and magic intuitiveness on a gun that you can't shoot 50 rounds through because it's beating you to death. You know, and it's like Benny's fifty. I mean, I I'm open to a Barrett fifty. Like I've, you know, people shot Barrett fifties over me, but even then, it, it's not even the recoil of the the Barrett fifty. The overpressure on that round. Some some people gives them headaches. It gives me headaches. Years ago, I was um, I was shooting a Ruger number one. You know what a Ruger number one is? Oh hell yeah, I know what a Ruger number okay. one is. Okay. I was shooting a Ruger number one chambered in 375 Holland and Holland. And these were some pretty stout hand loads, buddy of mine loaded up. And I'm shooting this off a bench on sandbags. And after the third shot, I put a sandbag up against my shoulder, to, <laughs> you know, in between the buttstock and my shoulder. Yeah. I, after, tw- after, a, you know, 20 rounds, through this, I'm like, I'm so fucking done with this. The, the next day, from my damn near to my elbow, up to my shoulder, and down through my chest was just a big black bruise. I mean, you know, man, it, those things are, I mean, you know, and that was just a 375 Holland in Holland. I say just, I mean, it's a, that's a pretty stout round, but. Do you re- but, didn't, didn't I sell you a fifty uh, was it, or four fifty four Casul? Didn't I sell that to you years ago? Yeah, you did. You actually did sell me one of those because it was like ah, I'm not firing this anymore. Um, yeah, it was a, a Taurus Raging Bull, and yeah. uh, and I uh, I played with it. I shot it. I reloaded with it. You know, I reloaded and and played with it and had a lot of fun with it and. And then it was, uh, yeah, it's you sold time. It. It's time to pass this on to someone else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, whatever, dude. This um, is not fun. Yeah, yeah so it, you know, it, I, it, I, I, I just yeah, it, dread. I just dread that you know, there's kids on some of these cool guy places on the internet that are all now running, wanting to run out and buy McMillan Tac fifties, and it's just like you kids are making a mistake. Oh yeah, big time a mistake. Making a mistake. And, you know, there's even, and again, you know, the 338. 338 is a great round. It's a great round, but mm-hmm. it's being sur- supplanted. I wouldn't say surpassed. I would say supplanted by the, you know, Crane's been pushing, was it 300 normal Magnum? But also, which is, you know, uh, they're 300, you know, 30 caliber bullet. But then now with some of these, you know, milled ballistic tip. You know, milled bullets. There's people getting 338 Lapua performance out of a 300 Winchester Magnum, and what do you know? They're stepping back to the 300 Winchester Magnum, 
you know, for the for these extreme long range for these engagement distances at three that you can do with three thirty eight because a three hundred Winchester Magnum it's a smaller gun, it's a you know it's a smaller action and it's not as sucky to shoot. Um, and three hundred three three hundred Win Mag is not a bad gun to shoot. I mean, no. it, it, it's it's not. I mean, you know, um, you know, I mean, you can load does it, heavy does, and yeah. Does it does it have recoil? Sure, it does. But you know, if the if the recoil for a three hundred win mag is uh, is too much for you, you know, um, hand your rifle to a real man and pick up your Ruger ten twenty two. There's guys, you know, dude. <laughs> there's you know, look, dude. There's guys, you know that. You know, every time I make a point about these guys that buy these 18, 19, 20 pound sniper rifles, and, you know, they're all like, oh man, you need to go to the gym and work out. And I'm like, obviously, you don't fucking see me because I go to the fucking gym every day, and you're just some jackass on the fucking internet that doesn't actually know his asshole from a hole in the ground. And I would smoke your ass out in the field. You know, these, these big ass heavy guns, there's just no getting around the fact that they're big ass heavy guns. Mm-hmm. And people, yeah. they they fixate on one data point and don't really, you know, look at the big picture. And I well, just well, curious how many TAC 50s are going to be bought and then end up for sale used because it was the same way at the 338, dude. All these guys bought these 338s and they ordered them from all these full custom shops. And, you know, and then you see them for sale and they sit there and nobody buys them and they get cheaper and cheaper because they kind of <laughs> they're kind of not the greatest gun to shoot. Well, look, having a fifty-pound rifle doesn't mean a doesn't mean diddly shit if you back your car up to the uh, to the uh, re- to the bench, open your trunk, pull your rifle case out, carry it over to the bench, you know, ten feet away. Open your case, pull your rifle out of the case, put it up on your sandbags or whatever you're shooting off of, and then you spread out all your gear and your ammo and add, and you put your targets up and you're sitting there shooting it off of the bench. Weight doesn't mean a damn thing. Now, if you're humping it in the field, that's another matter entirely. Well, think about it like this. This this Canadian sniper that made this 2.13, I guess whatever it is, this two-mile shot, with a 50 BMG McMillan bolt gun, okay, he probably didn't back his SUV up to the gun range and walk 15 feet to his to his to his shooting bench so he probably has to carry this gun around and he's probably shooting this gun enough that he's able to you know wild ass guess and figure out some of these kinds of shots even if he set the shot up and they they pre-marked it cuz that's part of me's like 3400 meters um they, you know, there, there's. I just can't have. I can't help but feel that this wasn't like, hey, there's a guy over there. Let's figure out this dope. I personally feel they probably saw an area that was active, and they were like, we're going to come back here tomorrow, and we're going to work on this all night, and maybe take this shot. But even then, what's impressive is a guy who's carrying a Tac 50, shooting a Tac 50 enough, and has enough skill set to make that shot. It's not the single shot that, to me, that just is like, oh, interesting. To me, the f- whoever's shooting a fifty caliber bolt action rifle enough <laughs> to be that proficient with it, oh my god! I just wonder how many detached retinas is that fucking guy going to get in his life? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's you know, it yeah, just I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's, I mean, it's, it, a it's, impr- it's a difference between a headline on the internet and someone that actually spends time behind a gun and knows what goes into it. It's just like, oh, oh, yeah. fuck that. I don't want any part of that. Yeah, no. I mean, look, um, would it be nice to have a TAC-50 in the armory? Eh, yeah, sure. I don't really want to spend the money. We, You know, I mean, you've already got the three thirty eight Lapua, so don't really need a TAC-50. We'll probably get a Barrett one day. Um, I, you know what? I mean, I, I wouldn't mind a Barrett if you know if one came along at a decent price. I mean, I don't really want to pay stupid money for it, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean I wouldn't be interested in you know in in throwing one in the armory. If, like I said, if it came along, it you know if, you know for the right price. Mm-hmm. You see them. I mean, you know, I, I've seen them even in in like you and I travel. I see them used, uh, and you know they're never. Barrett's 
Yeah. Barrett's are actually pretty easy to pick up because, you know, just what you said, people buy it and they can't afford to feed it. But more importantly, you got to have room to shoot it. I mean, that's, you know. I mean, 330, to give people some reference here, if you're not really a, a, a rifle person, and that, that's totally fair. You know, you can be a rifle person and still not be into these types of rifles. You know, the general rule of thumb for 338 Lapua, now mind you, not 50, 338 Lapua, the the general rule of thumb is that that, that round doesn't even really start to, you know, I would say settle in and fly until 1500 yards. So that shot when I made that my my when I posted the photograph at our East Coast facility and I made the best five shot group of my life and um you know uh uh you know took that took that picture of it. Yeah. That was a thousand yards. The 338 Lapua doesn't even like it's not stretching its legs it's not, at that point. It's, it's not even like a point blank range until like fifteen hundred yards. And point blank range is probably a little bit of a statement, but so anyway. Yeah, but 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 I you know, we know what you're saying. Yeah. And, and 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 that's the thing. And I mean, you know, these big fifty BMGs, three thirty eight Lapuas, I mean, man, you have to have a lot of yardage, man, to to I mean why would you want to shoot one at a hundred or two hundred yards? I mean, really. Just just yards. get well, you know how many how, yeah. how many ranges max out at three hundred yards? A, a lot of them, mm-hmm. you know. So if you've got a fifty BMG or a, or a three thirty eight Lapu and you're shooting at three hundred yards, dude, just get yourself a three hundred eight. Yeah, you know, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be less punishing. You're going to be able to shoot it more, mm-hmm. and that's what it's all about. It's a you know, cool, it's a cool headline, but you know if your kid's sitting at home and you're wanting to run out and you know buy a fifty BMG, well, you know, okay, you know, uh, even oh I can get a three thirty eight and kind of get the better performance or four six mm-hmm. three seventy five shy tack. It's like uh, okay, uh, you know, I, I mean see. for us to even get the you know if we were to get a fifty, we would have to take it out to our East Coast facility because we can shoot about two miles out there. Yeah, but, you know, well, we I mean, look, mile. look, look, if you live in Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, I don't know, Montana, whatever, Alaska, and, you know, and you can and, and you have all the, you know, all the desert or tundra or whatever, and you have all the range in the world and it's not a problem. OK, cool. But look, if you live east of the Mississippi and you're in your longest range is three to six hundred yards. Did you put it? Don't waste your time or money. Mm-hmm. You'd be better off spending buying yourself a good 308 or a 300 win mag, using that, and the money you save on that on the rifle plus the ammo will allow you to shoot ten times more rounds a year than you would with a 50 or a 338. Yeah, 300 300 win mag will own your shit at fucking 1200 yards i mean i mean people don't realize a thousand yards is a long way 300 wind mag i mean you'd take them 15 if you want but 300 wind mag at 1200 all day yeah all day i mean yeah 1200 yeah, but, yards but, is a long but, shot but the, but the point is if it's still an okay round for three to six hundred yard shooting it's going to perform very well oh yeah yeah I, you, know. you know so and uh, and and it's not going to kill the bank account. No, I mean, it's, I mean it's not going to be cheap. It's not like shooting twenty two, but it's very affordable to shoot. Yeah. All right, we've been going kind of a while here, so I guess you better wrap this one up. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. All right, well, this wraps up episode sixty seven of the John nineteen eleven podcast. If you like this podcast and uh, like our content, think about leaving us some feedback on iTunes or iHeartRadio if they have that. Uh, one star is fine, or five stars even better. Um, you know, I'd like to hear from you. Um, remember, it's all about uh, shooting guns and having fun. And everybody, have a good day. See you later. <laughs>